Good afternoon, church. I would like to everyone to stand up in honor of the word of God. Today's scriptures reading taken from Exodus chapter 33, verse 12 to 17. Let's read together in the count of three. One, two, and three. Moses said to the Lord, See, you say to me, Bring up these people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. Yet you have said, I know you by name, and you have also found favor in my sight. Now, therefore, if I have found favor in your sight, please show me your, your, your ways, that I may know you in order to find favor in your sight. Consider this, that this nation is your people. And he said, My presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. And he said to him, If your presence will not go with me, do not bring us up from here. For shall, shall it be known that I have found favor in your sight, I and your people? Is it not in your going with us, so that we are distinct, I and your people, from every other people on the face of the earth? And the Lord said to Moses, This very thing that you have spoken I will do, for you have favor in my sight, and I know your name. This is the word of the Lord. Praise be to God. You all may be seated. Awesome. So we are right now, right in the middle of a sermon series on prayer, Lifeline. And I don't know about you, but this series really helped me a lot in my personal prayer life. I mean, I can honestly say I pray so much more than before uh, because of this series, because of preparing for this sermon series, because I have to pray. Otherwise, how can I teach people to pray? So I've been blessed by it. And my hope is by the end of this sermon series, not only me, but all of us will pray more. Okay? And that's the goal. The goal is not for us to know more about prayer. The goal is for us to pray more as a church. And today, what I want to specifically talk about is, does prayer change things? Okay? That's the one I want to talk about. Because here's the thing, though. All of us want our life to matter. Am I right? I mean, we want to know that we are significant and important. And the fact of the matter is, no one can live without that deep assurance that we matter. And there's a biblical term for it, and the biblical term for it is glory. So the word glory comes from the Hebrew word kabot. Okay, say that word with me together, kabot, okay? So maybe Japanese, Javanese word, adopt that, called abot, is similar. Because kabot actually means, literally, it means weighty. It means importance and significance. Here's the thing. All of us need that glory. We can't live without that glory. Some of us might after professional glory, artistic glory, political glory, relational glory, or maybe financial glory. So that means if, let's say if you're a pianist and you're seeking glory, what you're looking for is actually someone to come up to you and say, wow, you are amazing pianist. Pianist? Pianist? How do you, spell, how do you pronounce that? Pianist, is it? Pianist, well, okay, there you go. Something wrong with my English today. So you want to hear people say, you know what, you are amazing. Let me change it. Violinist, there you go. <laughs> Save a word. You're amazing violinist. Like you're one of the best violinists I've ever heard. And you're amazing. You're one of the best. When someone says that to you, how that makes you feel? Well, of course, because you grew up in church, because you are in Rock Sydney, English service, you will say what? Soli Dio Gloria. All glory to God. Of course, you say that with your mouth, but can we be honest that deep inside our heart, when, we, when people say that to us, we actually feel happy about it? Because we feel like actually I matter. I'm someone. What I do matter. That's glory. Everyone needs glory. Now imagine someone who does not have it. So they walk around and say, you know what? I don't really matter. Nothing I do matter. People don't even know that I exist. I'm not important at all. If you meet people like that, they're in big danger. You know why? Because they might take their own life. Because no one can live without glory. And Moses understand this. Moses understand that he cannot live without glory. But rather than seeking his own glory, Moses prays to God. He says this, please show me your glory. And this is probably one of the most famous prayer in the Bible. And it is our text for tonight. 
So tonight, these texts, I believe, will answer our longing for glory, for significance, and at the same time will answer the question, does prayer change things? So before we go into the text, let me give you the context first. The context on which Moses actually prayed his prayer. Because our text come right after the story of the golden calf. Remember the story of the golden calf? So think about what the Israel has experienced at this point, right? So a few weeks earlier, the people of Israel, they saw the ten plagues happen. So they saw how God sent hail, darkness, and ultimately how God killed every firstborn of Egyptian, but spared the Israelites. And then they saw the Red Sea split into two. I mean, can you imagine that scene? Like walking on a dry ground with all the sharks and turtles swimming around you, with the background voice of Maria Carey and Whitney Houston singing, There can be miracles when you what? Like even if you do not believe, when you hear that, it made you believe. And once they got to the other side, the Red Sea closed and swallowed the Egyptian army. And when they got to Mount Sinai, God established a covenant with them. And God said, listen, Israel, I've set you free from the slavery of Egypt. Now you're mine. You belong to me. I've redeemed you. And now you're to obey my voice and keep my covenant, and I will make you my treasured possession. And the people of Israel said, yes, Lord, we are yours. And then Moses went up to the mountain to meet with God. And the purpose of Moses went up to the mountain to meet with God is actually to make a plan on how God can dwell among his people because that's God's desire. God wants to be close with his people. So that plan is called the tabernacle system. So it's God's desire to be among his people. But did you know what the people of Israel did? They created a statue of golden calf and worshipped it. So these were the same people who witnessed, who just witnessed the mighty hand of God. These were the same people who just confessed to God, Lord, we are your people, and we want to live in a covenantal relationship with you. And in a matter of days, they broke the covenant. And God was extremely angry and wanted to kill them. So God said to Moses, Mo, I can't do this anymore. I'm so angry, I'm going to kill all of them, but not you. I'm going to start over with you, and I'm going to make a great nation of you, but not Israel. I'm going to kill all of them. And Moses replied, you remember, God, you can't do that. If you do that, what will other nations think of you, God? They will think that you are incapable and incompetent God. It is your name and reputation that is at stake. So Moses actually stands in the gap between the holy God and the sinful people of Israel. And a couple of verses later, Moses said this famous, famous line. If you grew up in church, you heard this before. In Exodus 32, First 31 to 32, Moses returned to the Lord and said, Alas, these people have sinned a great sin. They have made for themselves gods of gold. But now, if you will forgive their sin, listen, but if not, please blot me out of your book that you have written. What a prayer. So Moses said to God, God, if you want to forgive their sin, here's what, I, what you do. Remove my name from the book of life. Man. So Moses said, let me die with them. But say, God says, uh-uh. So if last week we saw how Abraham interceded for Sodom, today we see Moses interceded for the people of Israel. But if God say yes to Abraham, God say no to Moses. Uh-uh. Can't do that, Moses. So now Moses is caught in the tension between God's holiness and Israel's desperate need for God. Because God's holiness said, punishment must happen, must happen. And yet, Israel said, we need you, God. And so in our passage for today, Moses met God in a tent, and God speak to Moses as a man speak to his friend. So what's happening inside this tent is a high-level negotiation between God and Moses. Here's a question. Can God, I mean, can Moses change God's mind? Okay, I want you to think about it. Can Moses change God's mind? God's mind. Because Israel's destiny depends on what happened in this tent of meeting. So let's look at it together. I have three points for my sermon. Three things that Moses asked. Moses prayed for God's word. So Moses prayed God's word. Moses desired God's presence. And Moses seeks God's glory. Let's look at the first one. First one. Pray God's word. In verse 12 to verse 13. Moses said to the Lord, 
See, you say to me, bring up these people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. Yet you have said, I know you by name, and you have also found favor in my sight. Now therefore, if I have found favor in your sight, please show me now your ways, that I may know you in order to find favor in your sight. Consider too that this nation is your people. I mean, I love how straightforward Moses is with God. Because he says to God, God, I can't do this without you, man. You are the one who told me to bring these people to the promised land. You are the one who chose me for this job. I never put my resume in. I did not choose myself for this job. You chose me. And you promised that you will be with me. That's why I took this job in the first place. But now you said, you ain't going. Then I'm confused. Then who's going with me? How will I know you and your ways if you're not with me? But to understand why Moses says this, you need, we need to read what God said to Moses earlier. Okay? In first 1, to 3, this is what God says to Moses. The Lord said to Moses, Depart, go up from here, you and the people whom you have brought up out of the land of Egypt, to the land of which I swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying, To your offspring I will give it. I will send an angel before you, and I will drive out the Canaanites, the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Hevites, and the Jebusites. Go up to the land flowing with milk and honey, but I will not go up among you, lest I consume you on the way, for you are a stiff-necked people. So this is what God saying to Moses. Moses, I'll give you the promised land. You will have it. I will keep my promises. I will give you military success economic success, prosperity, wealth, you will have all of them. But here's the thing, I'm not going. Instead, I'll send an angel before you. He will lead you. Because if I go with you, Moses, I don't know what I will do to that sinful people. I might kill all of them before they get to the promised land because how sinful they are. Did you hear that? I mean, this is very amusing. First, God is calling Israel the people whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt. (laughs) So God is saying to Moses, they're not my people, Moses. They are your people. And Moses is like, no, these are not my people. These are your people. It's like when a mom doesn't know what to do with her son anymore, and she says to her husband, do something about your son. And the husband like, my son? Don't you know that you're the one who gave birth to this son? That's what happened here. And second, think about it. What an offer from God, right? Because most people consider this a dream religion. Think about it. You get all the wealth, power, success, and everything you want without the hard work of living a life that's centered around God. All the joy without the pain, all benefit without the maintenance costs. It's like the joy of having a child without the pain of raising a child. Do you know what we call them? Grandparents. And this is what most people want, right? The grandparent God whose job is to give them what they want with no condition attached. This is a dream over. And this is what God is offering Israel and Moses. What would you say if God offered you the same thing? Moses say, thank you for the offer. Thank you for giving us a promised land. Thank you for sending an angel to lead me. But what I need is you. Not an angel. So teach me your way that I may know you. So Moses is saying, I will not settle for anything less than you. But here's where I want to draw your attention. Moses disagree with God. You with me on that? Moses argue with God. I mean, come on, think about it. What give him the guts to argue with the God of the universe? You know what it is? God's words. Because Moses argued with God using God's words. He said, God, you said, you know me. You said, you love me. You said, I have found favor in your sight. You said, you will be with me. That's what you said. So I won't settle for anything less than what you have said to me. Do you see what happened here? Which teach us a very important lesson on prayer. 
And what is that? The most persuasive prayers argue from promises that God has revealed through His words. See, the reason Moses dares to argue with God, the reason he has the confidence to do that, because he put his hope and confidence in God who keeps his promises. And Moses understood that God will not fail to keep his promises. And that is our confidence to bring our prayer to God. The kind of prayer that God loves most is the kind of prayer that rests on his promises. Because when we do that, we say to God, God, I trust you. God, I put my hope in you. I put my trust and rest in you and your promises. And that is why to pray effectively, we need to know God and his word. Praying God's word back to God is the most powerful type of prayer. The most effective prayer are the ones that begin with the word of God. Now, let me, let me give you a personal example. I'm the type who get anxious very easily. Anyone else? Any, any anxious people here? Okay, we're going to tackle this at the end of our series. We're going to spend whole time talking about this. So I'm just going to give you four tastes of it. So whenever I'm dealing with my anxiety, what do I do? How do I pray to God about my anxiety? I can't just say, God, I'm anxious. Please make me not anxious. That's a good start. But that's not sufficient. Because what I need to do, I need to pray God's word back to God. So here's what I do. So I open my Bible and look at one of God's promises that deal with anxiety. Okay, and one of my favorite ones is this verse. Okay, I used this before, but this is my favorite one. Matthew 6, verse 26. Jesus say, look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor rape nor gather into bonds. And yet your heavenly Father fits them. Are you not of more value than they? So now when, my, when I meditate on this first and when I pray on this first, this first tells me how much God cares for me. This is what Jesus said. Look at the birds of the air. So I look up and look at the birds of the air. We see what? Hundreds and thousands of them. Every single one of them finds food daily. And yet none of them store food. None of them store a rib. Where did they get that food from? And the text tells us, God provide for every one of them. And so the question now is, how much more valuable am I compared to them? So I have to think now. So I have birds on one side. I have me on the other side. Which one is more valuable? Some of you might say, birds, that's okay. But God says, I am. So now, but it required me to think again. And when I went up pray this prayer, it started to think, well, wait, hold on a second. Why am I more valuable than birds? Because think about it. What does it cost God to provide for birds? Nothing. But Jesus said, God is my heavenly father. What does it cost God to make me his children? It costs him the life of his one and only beloved son to die for my sin. So now I connect the dots. If that's how valuable I am, and if God provides for birth that costs him nothing, will he not provide for me that costs him everything? Then what reason do I have to be anxious? So now when I understand this, when I meditate on this, then I can pray to God, God, I feel like right now you're not taking care of me. God, I feel like right now you're abandoning me. I can't see your hand in my situation. I'm anxious. But I know that can't be true. I know your words. I know your promises. And your words say that I'm much more valuable than birds of the air. And you are my heavenly father. And if that's the case, then I can be sure that you will not fail to take care of me. I bank on your promises. So God, please help my anxious heart. This is how we pray God's word back to God. More on this in a couple of weeks. But here's what God said to Moses. So after Moses said that prayer, God said, verse 14, and he said, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. You know why? Because God cannot go back on his own word. So when Moses put God's word back to God, God like, all right, fine, Moses, 
I'll go with you. So God said yes to Moses' request for God. He will, not longer, he will no longer send angel before Moses. God himself would go with Moses. But, there's still but, but God ignored Moses' request to be with the people of Israel. Because the you in here, I know you can't say it in English, but the you in Hebrew here is singular. It's referring to Moses. So God says, yes, Moses, I will be with you. I will help you, but not Israel. So God agreed to meet Moses in the middle. You know what we call this? Win-win. Moses got God's presence, and God doesn't have to deal with Israel. Now, can we agree this is a big win already for Moses? This is a big win. Does Moses stop there? He doesn't. Moses asks for more. Look at the second thing that Moses asks. Moses desire God's presence, verse 15 to 16. And he said to him, If your presence will not go with me, do not bring us up from here. For how shall it be known that I have found favor in your sight, I and your people? Is that not in your going with us so that we are distinct, I and your people, from every other people on the face of the earth? See, Moses understand that the one that needs God's presence is not just him, but Israel desperately needs God's presence. Because if God is not present with his people, then God's people won't be able to carry out God's mission to be God's people. Because what makes Israel distinct from every other nation is the fact that God is with Israel. And John McKay put it like this. If the Lord is not prepared to show his presence with his people as distinct from merely with Moses himself, then they have lost their special calling and status as the Lord's covenant people. And there's no point in the moving forward to the land. It will be better to remain in the wilderness at Sinai than to enter Canaan without the Lord's full blessing and endorsement. In other words, Moses once again said, right, God, thank you for promising to be with me. That's great. That's awesome. But that's not enough. If you're not going, we're not going. We will only go if you go. Full stop. What a man. The question is, is Moses blackmailing God here? I don't think so. Because Moses understands what Exodus is all about. He knows that it is part of God's saving plan for saving, to save the world. He knows that the only way that Israel can fulfill their part in that plan of God is by having God with them. Because if God is not with Israel, then what makes Israel different from other nations? Because Israel is not God's people because of their land. Israel is not God's people because of their wealth. Israel is not God's people because of their culture, their righteousness, or their strength. No. Israel is God's people because God is with them. So if God is removed from the equation, then Israel is nothing. The only thing that separates Israel from all other nations is the fact that God is with Israel. And that is why Moses says to God, God, you can keep all the blessings. If you're not coming with us, I don't want it. Now let me ask you this question. If God offer you everything you dream of, riches, wealth, health, success, fame, but God is not with you, would you take it? If God says to you, I'll give you what your heart desires. I'll give you your dream. I'll give you a great future, a loving family, a good health, a successful career. But you won't have me. What will you say? Your answer to this question reveal whether God is useful or beautiful to you. Listen. If you see God as beautiful, you want God just for who he is in himself, not for what you get out of it. If you see God as useful, God is simply a mean to something else that you want more than God. Imagine this situation, okay? This is just illustration. Let's say you're engaged. You're about to be married and you're excited. And during the engagement, 
you decided to invest all your money into robot trading to secure your future, and later you discover it is a scam. So you lost all your money, and there's no way to get it back. You are completely broke. And then you tell to your fiance, I'm sorry, honey. I really want to secure our future, but I lost everything. I'm completely broke. And then she says, well, if that's the case, we should not get married. Let's break the engagement. And she'll leave you. Question, how would you feel? You will be devastated, right? Because you will feel used. You will say, all this time, she never loved me. She never loved me for me. She loved me for my money. In other words, you are simply a means to an end. You will feel violated. And don't you realize that a lot of time that's how we approach God? We say, God, look at what I've done. I come to church on time. I bring my kids to church. I join MC. I pray. I've been a good person. I serve. But God, why are you not answering my prayer? I'm disappointed in you and I have enough. I'm leaving. If that's you, what we're saying is we marry God for his money. But Moses is different. Moses say, God, you can keep your money. What I want is you. It's better for me in a desert with you than in a promised land without you. Unless I have you, I have nothing. Because Moses has come to see God as beautiful in himself. So friends, here's my question before we move on. Do you see God as beautiful or useful? If tonight you have to choose everything without God or nothing with God, what will be your choice? But pay attention to what happened next. What happened next is extremely breathtaking, okay? His amazing part. So in verse 17, then God responded, and the Lord said to Moses, this very thing that you have spoken, I will do. For you have found favor in my sight, and I know you by name. Did you realize what just happened? God listened to Moses. One second, God said, I'm not going. The next second, God said, I'm going. I will do what you ask, Moses. I will go with you and the people of Israel to the promised land. I mean, do you realize what Moses has just done? Moses has just altered the destiny of the people of Israel. So first, Moses persuaded God not to destroy the Israelites because of the golden calf incident. Then he convinced God to stay with him and lead him. And now Moses made God go with the people of Israel. In other words, listen to this. Moses change God's mind. Let that sink in. Moses' prayer changed God's mind and altered the destiny of Israel. Now I realize, I realize there's a tension now. This is not easy to digest because the thought of God changing his mind is making many of us deeply uncomfortable because it goes against our deep conviction of who God is. Like some of you I know are ready to throw your shoes at me and walk out of the building right now. But before you do that, hear me out. And I'm going to tell you three different truths that we must hold in tension because on the surface they look like contradiction, but they're not. These truths are everywhere in the Bible and they work in harmony. But let me warn you, we will never fully understand how these three truths work together in harmony, but they are. Okay? And I'm stealing this from J.D. Greer, and J.D. Greer is stealing this from David Platt, and David Platt is stealing this from, I don't know who, maybe John Piper. So that's the way a preacher works, okay? We steal from each other. So there are three truths that we must hold in tension. Truth number one, God's purpose are unchanging. It means that what God has determined from the very beginning will come to fruition. How do we know? Numbers 23, verse 19. God is not man that he should lie, or son of man that he should change his mind. Has he said and will he not do it? Or has he spoken and he will not fulfill it? What God has spoken, he will fulfill it. 
because God never learns anything new. He knows the end from the very, very beginning. He doesn't gain some new insight than to need, that makes him need to reevaluate his plan. God does not change his mind. That's truth number one. So you can put your shoes back on now. I think the person next to you, if you do that, are praying right now. Please do it soon. But now I know your question. Your question is, hold on a second. You just said that Moses changed God's mind. And now you tell me God never changed his mind. Make up your mind, yours. Just wait. Number two. God's plan are unfolding. In Exodus 32 and 33, God changed his course of action, course of action based on Moses' prayer. But notice, it is God who actually created the moment of crisis, setting up circumstances to give Moses a chance to argue with God. And it is God who told Moses what was going on, and it is God who made the promise that Moses used to argue with God. In other words, God placed Moses into a situation in which Moses would see the problem, remember God's promise, and then petition God to change the course of action that God had announced. Let me repeat that. God placed Moses in a situation in which Moses would see the problem, remember God's promise, and then petition God to change the course of action that God had announced. With another word, from the very beginning, God wanted Moses to argue with God. So God sovereignly put Moses there. But God's true intention were not revealed all at once. He unfolds them over time. You still with me? Which led us to the third truth that we must hold intention. Prayers are instrumental. When we look at it from our perspective, Moses' prayer really does change things. Without Moses' prayer, God will have destroyed Israel. Yes, God has set things up for Moses to pray that prayer, but nevertheless, Moses' prayer is instrumental in getting God to change his course of action. And I know what you're thinking right now, okay? Well, if that's true, what, if that's true, yours, here's the question. What if Moses did not pray, right? Does that mean that God will have killed all Israel? Or will God just get someone else to pray for Israel? And this make our head spin. I understand your what if question. I do. Okay? And let me try to answer your what if question by asking you some more questions. Here's my question. Does God know the day that you will die? Yeah, of course. Has he appointed it? Yes. Can you do anything to change that day? No. Then what do you eat? What happens when you don't eat? You die. So if you don't eat and die, will that be the day that God has appointed you to die? The point is, stop asking stupid questions and eat. Because eating is the preordained way that God has appointed for living. Can you see where I'm going with this? Prayer is the preordained way God has determined to get His will done on earth. See, Moses does not dwell on the unchanging purpose of God. Why? Because he does not know the unchanging purpose of God. But Moses knew the unchanging promises of God, and he applied them into his situation, and therefore, Moses prayed. And in the unfolding plan of God's unchanging purpose, God uses Moses' prayer to save Israel. David Platt summarized it this way. When we pray, we take our God-given place and use our God-ordained privilege to participate with Him in the accomplishment of His purposes on the planet. So friends, God accomplished His purposes through the prayer of His people. Prayer is one of the law of God which God has set from the very beginning of the world by which He runs the world. It's like gravity. 
We can't ignore the law of prayer as much as we can't ignore the law of gravity. And I believe God sovereignly placed us in certain situations for the purpose of us praying His promises. That's why He put you where you are. Think about all the problems you see around you right now. The broken relationship, the dysfunctional family, the people from, from God. God puts you there so that you can see the problem, pray God's promises, and see God works powerfully. Wherever you are, wherever we are, we are not there by accident, but divine appointment. We are there to make a difference. Does prayer change this thing? Absolutely. God's unchanging purpose will happen no matter what. But our prayers are part of God's unfolding plan. And that's why we can pray with confidence and anticipation that God, the good God, He will not fail to accomplish His good purposes as we pray to Him. But then, as if that's not good enough, Moses asked for more. The third thing, seek God's glory. Verse 18 to 23. Moses said, Please show me your glory. And he said, I will make all my goodness to pass before you and will proclaim before you my name, the Lord. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. But, he said, you cannot see my face for a man shall not see me and live. And the Lord said, behold, there's a place by me where you shall stand on the rock and while my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft of the rock and I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take away my hand, and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. Moses asked for more. And what I request it is, because up to this point, Moses has seen glimpses of God's glory. He's seen the burning bush. He's seen the ten plagues. He see God parting the Red Sea. He see the cloud of fire. He see the mountaintop experience of God's presence. But for Moses, that's not enough. He wants more. Because here's what I know about those who have tasted a bit of God's glory. They can't have enough. They want more of God's glory. So therefore, Moses asked God, God, please show me your glory. And this is a remarkable prayer because to want to see God's glory is to want to see God in all His beauty. What Moses wants above all is to see God in all His beauty because he understands that the answer to human longing is that beauty. The answer to that human longing is the glory of God. Life is meaningless without it. And that is why when we see God as beautiful, we pray to God not just for things. We pray to God for God. Instead of simply saying, God, I need your help to do this and that, we find what we need in God. Instead of simply praying, God, help me to achieve this and that, we find that achievement in God. So this is Moses' request. God, show me your glory. You know what God say? No, Moses. Moses, I will show you my goodness. But you cannot see my full glory because you cannot see my face and live. Because I am too beautiful for you to see. You won't be able to take it. It will destroy you. But here's what I do. I will walk past before you and I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. And then Moses, you can see my back, but not my face. So this is yes and no answer from God. Can you see that? In a way, God said, yes, Moses, you will get to see more of my glory. But no, Moses, you will not get to see the fullness of my glory because why? You will die. Now, most of you probably do not know this movie because you weren't born yet. But there's this movie called Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. People from my generation know this. In that movie, some Nazis look into the Ark of Covenant and remember what happened? They melted like wax. Remember that scene, peeps, from my generation? And God is telling Moses, if you see me in all my glory, you will melt like wax. So I'm going, I'm going to cover you with my hand. But he's, in, pay attention to the important change in the way God speaks. 
Moses say what? God, I want to see your glory. God says, I'm going to show you my goodness. But not all of it, Moses, just the backside of my goodness, which means God's glory is connected to God's goodness. God's greatest glory is that He is good. And to see all of God's glory is to see all of God's goodness. But then look what happened when God actually showed up in the mountain. So I'm going to cheat a little bit here. So we jump to Exodus chapter 34, verse 5 to 7. Here's what happened. The Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and the fourth generation. Now this is confusing. Because on one hand, God said, I'm infinitely loving, I'm infinitely gracious, I forgive sin. But God also said, I will never let sin go unpunished. Contradiction. I'm infinitely loving, I want to forgive sin. I'm infinitely just, I must punish sin. And both are true of God. This is God's glory. This is God's goodness. Why does God want to forgive sin? Because He's good in the sense of being loving. Why does God want to punish sin? Because He's good in the sense of being just. So what we see is God is both infinitely loving and infinitely just. To which we go, hold up. That's not possible. God is either perfectly loving, so He forgives people and does not punish people, or He's perfectly just, so He punishes people and does not forgive people. He can't have both. But God says, I am both. That's my glory. That's my goodness. I am infinitely loving, and I am infinitely just. That's my glory. And that's what Moses see at the top of the mountain. Moses see the back part of God's goodness. And if the Bible ends, Exodus 34, that's all we're going to know. All we can see is the back part of God's goodness, which seems like a contradiction. But how many of you know, today we have something far greater than Moses because we have the front part of God's goodness. Listen to what John said, John 1 verse 14. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen His glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of what? Grace and truth. Do you know this, who this verse talk about? This verse is talking about Jesus Christ. Jesus took on a human form, and then He dwelt. And the word dwell, He is actually the word tabernacle. He became flesh and tabernacle among us. Isn't that God's desire from the very beginning? To be among His people? And now John said, we have seen His glory full of grace and truth. You know what, God, what John is saying? John is saying, if Moses can only see the back part of God's goodness, today, you and me, through Jesus Christ, we can see what Moses was not allowed to see. We can see the front part of God's infinite glory and goodness in Jesus Christ. Because Jesus come to reveal that glory to us. How? How can God be infinitely loving to forgive sin and infinitely just to punish sin at the same time? The answer, the cross of Jesus Christ. What happened at the cross? Jesus cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? See, at the cross, Jesus was ignored. For the first time in his life, God the Father turned his face away from his son. See, at the cross, Jesus experienced the greatest, the worst nightmare every human being could ever experience. And what is that? The loss of the face of God. See, at the cross, Jesus did not matter. Because at the cross, Jesus got what we deserve because of sin. What is that? Absolute insignificance. 
the punishment of sin fell on Jesus. He was cosmically ignored. The infinite justice of God fell upon Jesus and it is upheld once and for all. Why? So that you and I can receive the infinite love of God. Jesus lost the face of God so that you and I can receive the face of God and that's how we can be forgiven and that's how we know today that we matter eternally. And it is only then, it's only when we gaze on the cross of Jesus Christ, we finally see God as beautiful. Think about it. If you do not believe the gospel, you might believe in a loving God who loves everyone no matter what. But is it beautiful? Is that God move your heart? Is that God who loves everyone bring tears to your eyes? No, it doesn't. It's just a nice God, but not beautiful. Or you might believe in a just God who demands everyone to pay for their sin. Is that beautiful? Does that change your life? The fact that you have to try harder, try so much, that maybe, just maybe, you make it to heaven? Does that motivate you, make you captivated by beauty? No, it doesn't. It's only when you gaze at the gospel that you see all of God's goodness pass before you and it captivates you. Because the gospel said that Jesus satisfied the demands of God's infinite justice so that we may receive forgiveness. That's beauty. And now because of Jesus, God looks at us and says, I love you with my infinite love. You matter to me. You are the best. That's glory. That's the significance that we've been wanting, isn't it? That's the thing that we crave for. We want someone to tell us that we matter, that we are significant. And in the gospel, we have it. And that is why the more we gaze on the gospel, the more God matters to us more than anything in this world, and the more we realize we matter to God. So now we won't have to look to right and left anything else to make us feel that we matter. Moses saw the back of God's goodness, but today we see the front, the gospel. Does prayer change things? Absolutely. But more than changing things, prayer give us God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for enabling us, Lord, to see your front part, your front part of your goodness. In giving Jesus Christ to die for our sin, we can see how you are both infinitely loving and infinitely just. How the perfect holy God demand punishment for every sin. And yet, because you're infinitely loving, you embraced and you took that punishment upon yourself and died on our behalf. So that we and I, that we can have the confidence that you are for us today. So that we can have the glory, the significance that we long for in you. And help us also to understand, Lord, that our prayer do matters. That is our prayer that you use to alter the situation around us, the life of people around us, the brokenness that we see around us, in your sovereign plan, you use our prayer to change that. So I pray that enable us, Lord, to come to you boldly, to pray to you, knowing, Lord, that yes, your unchanging purpose will remain no matter what. And yet in that beautiful purpose of your, you use integrate our prayer as part of your unfolding plans. What a joy, what an honor it is. And I pray we do not, not take this for granted, but we embrace this privilege and we come humbly to you and bring our prayer to you. And we will see you work powerfully in and through our prayer. Help us, Lord. Help us not to ask you just for things, but help us to see that ultimately prayer give us you and you are what matter to us above all. Thank you, Father. In the name of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Lesson to our faith as well.